He's working with the government. He's trying to become a respected figure. People say that's not. Let me try to stand up. Let me try to stand up. Exactly. And he starts to touch himself. His last words were, fear not and run towards the bliss of the sun. Well, what do I do now? I bet you guys haven't really heard of this one. The video that I'm gonna show you guys first is already outrageous, but when I give you the full context of the video, it gets 10 times more outrageous. But as I was going through this person's life story, it made me think about how, oh my God, so many people encounter this type of dude all the time. I need you guys to be aware of the self-victimizing aggressor who's always really, really sorry, but then they're gonna do that again, okay? And today, our self-victimizing aggressor that's really, really sorry, but they're gonna do it again is a guy named Nicholas Oliverdi. <laughs> I'm going to show you this video. <laughs> And then I'm going to explain everything going all the way back into the early 2000s. We were once a normal family, but thanks to the media, our lives have been interrupted. And we'd like privacy, and I would like to go back to being a normal husband. Let me explain something briefly. Nicholas is not actually sick. And also, during this interview with Dateline, he's claiming to be a man named Arthur that's from Scotland or the UK or something. And that's because prior to this, he had multiple warrants out for his arrest for sexual assault, for fraud, for theft. He kept rotating through different identities until he ultimately attempted to fake his own death by writing an insane obituary, which we'll get to, and it all culminates into him finally getting caught, but he claims not to be that fraudster, not to be that abuser, not to be that aggressor, but instead, he's a sick man from Scotland who's very, very sick, and he wants to just go back to being a normal husband. But everyone on the other end of these is like, like, no, you actually did all of this. Like, you actually did all this. And he says, no, 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 that's not me. Let me play the rest of the video, and then I'll explain. Um, I can't, because I can't breathe. I can't walk. Uh, Lie. People say, that's an act. Let me try to stand up. Let me try to stand up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what do you say to, to someone who believes that... <laughs> People say that's an act. Let me try to stand up. Let me try to stand up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what do you say to to someone who believes that that you are Nicholas Oliverdi? And I am not Andrea. I am not Nicholas Oliverdi, and I do not know how to make this clear. What do you say to people who say these are crocodile tears? Yeah. He's putting on a show. This is all an act. <laughs> Oh, also, I don't understand why they're where they're filming. It looks like they're in the 70s. Like it literally looks like they're in the 70s. And this is a really interesting case to me because I feel like we see this a lot on social media. People get called out for bad behavior and then they default to something that is very victim-y. And then we're like, well, f what do I do now? You know, there was a big mental health movement. There was a big like empathy movement where we all do and should be giving more empathy to things that weren't given much empathy in the past. But now we have to understand that there are people that are just blatantly taking advantage of that like this guy. And the hoops that he jumped through to conceal his identity, it's just ridiculous. So Nicholas, his real name is Aliverdian. He was born in Rhode Island and he had a pretty messed up childhood. He was kind of bouncing between government foster care. He was mostly in the hands of the government. Um, he was in some like government youth programs and it really kind of messed him up. So he becomes an advocate for these children and he becomes a critic of the state and how they handle a lot of these situations based off of his own experiences. And that's great. 
He's working with the government. He's trying to become a respected figure. And back in January 2008, he was at a community college called Sinclair Community College. And he met a girl on campus. And they kind of like hit it off. I mean, I can't even say hit it off because it was such a brief interaction. It was basically them talking and then him saying, Hey, can I walk you to your next class? He offers to walk her to her next class. And he corners her in the hallway and... He starts to touch himself. Like he just, he just met this girl. Literally just met her. And he pushes her up against the wall and he starts fondling himself. There's a whole lot here. I'm going to particularly give a trigger warning for this because I feel like for some people, this type of phrasing might like unlock some memories or something like that. So I'm going to do this. If you don't want to hear what he said, okay? When I do this, it means I'm, I've said it and it's done, okay? When she told him to stop, he said to her, I'm almost done. Don't be a bitch. <sighs> that infuriates me. Okay. It infuriates me because, I mean, obviously for a myriad of reasons, but it puts doubt and blame on the other person. Like I must be doing something wrong. And maybe if I just freeze, they'll stop. After that happened to her. She came out later and said that he would always try to apologize to her. He would always just come around and say, hey, I'm really sorry about what happened. He said to her that he couldn't help it. Like that's supposed to make anything better. And he told her that she was really, really beautiful and don't tell anybody. I just, I feel like that gives you so much insight into who this guy is. I, I think this was... Later in the same year, he kind of starts to play with going through different names. Maybe this was because his reputation was bad after what happened to her. She started telling people, rightfully so. He starts to go by the name Nicholas Rossi, maybe Rossi, R-O-S-S-I. -S -S tries to use this different name around campus, just introducing himself as that so he's not tied to that other incident. And then he does it again. He gets caught for public indecency when he's just jerking it in a hallway in front of people. And then what does he do? He does the same thing. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. You know, oh, it's, it's just you're so beautiful. Bro, disgusting. And also, I just want to remind you guys that this is the guy that I just showed you with the little oxygen mask on. This is what he was doing just 20 years prior. Believe it or not, it gets worse. In 2008, after this happens, even though he's kind of given out this fake name, he still has his fingerprints. He still has an identification card on him. They actually charge him for public indecency. So he has to register as a sex offender. This is a little bit later. The police get a call one night from a woman that's saying that she's hearing some screaming some kind of fighting going on in a different room and I, I believe this was one woman's friend the woman involved her friend the police show up they knock on the door and the woman answers the door and she's got marks around her neck she's got a ring around her eye she looks like she's been dealing with some stuff all night and guess who's there Nicholas <laughs> as usual and the police while they were there he starts apologizing to her and telling her in front of the police, oh, he didn't mean it. He was sorry. Oh, let's just end this. Let's just end this. Let's just call it a night. You know, officer, we're fine. And the officer is looking at her all beat up and then looking at him being crazy. And they said, we're going to take your ass <laughs> in. <laughs> like, they arrest him and put him in the back of the patrol car. But Nicholas is such a victim. He's such a little scared victim he starts to bash his head against the back of the bars or just the panel in the cop car and he starts to bash his head into it while screaming he's bashing it until he's bleeding and the officer is like they they don't know what to do so they have to pepper spray him to stop and then of course he cries wolf from that too i've been assaulted by the officers they pepper sprayed me they used way too much force i'm a victim i'm a victim i'm nick and i'm the victim remember what i was telling you guys earlier earlier that he had a bad reputation around St. Clair College for being a creep. Listen, if there's a guy that goes to your school that's <laughs> in the hallways, like you're going to hear about it and everyone's going to stay away from him and everyone's going to call him crazy, rightfully slow. He tries to sue the college by saying that the college made 
life altering false allegations. And he also claimed that he was deprived of a proper jury trial. I don't know. Maybe he wanted a jury trial so he could try to lie to as many people as possible and get away with it. But he becomes obsessed with trying to sue the school, trying to sue the girl. He actually did sue his victim and he accused her of libel all because she called him crazy. I don't know about you, but Nicholas seems pretty crazy to me. Seems like the label fits. Leave it on there. <laughs> Leave it on there. Uh, the judge ultimately ruled that his claims were without merit and they dropped it. So, of course, he's bored and it's time for him to get married again. He actually goes to like a singles group for people in the Church of Latter-day Saints and he pretends to be a Mormon. And that is where he meets his second wife. And then she divorced him seven months later. The court ruled that he was guilty of gross neglect of duty and extreme cruelty towards his wife. She was also granted a temporary restraining order. Oh, this one is crazy. <laughs> this one is actually nightmare fuel. Okay, so we're kind of moving through the years, all right? We started in 2008 and now we're in 2017. A lot has happened. Lawsuits, marriages, restraining orders, police, everything. And eventually, in June of 2017, he meets another woman. He meets her online. Um, her name was Michelle Minar. They start to talk. Things go well. He moved into her house around the third or fourth week that they had even met, right? He moves in. And the day that he moved in, the day, I can't believe I'm saying this, he told Michelle that she needed to get rid of her special needs daughter. That's what he said. If you want to be in this relationship, if you want to be with me, if you want to have all of this, you need to, that's literally what he said to her. And then it, it literally gets worse. It gets worse. And I'm telling all of this, I'm telling you guys all this because this motherfucker sat over here in an oxygen tank mask pretending to fall down a second ago. And people do this online all the time y'all want to believe him Th this is the track record that some people have after she told him what are you talking about i'm not getting rid of my daughter he assaulted her and then he took her money he took cash and then he also took her special needs daughter's like rainy day money that she just had saved up in her room he took it too took it and left what's crazy to me and this is why i keep reiterating this is guys we know people like this and it may not be the same exact things like assaulting people or stealing money or being horrible to people with special needs. It may not be these exact pockets of things, but we know people that do really terrible things have sh behavior, but they do it to a lot of vulnerable people that they think are easy to manipulate. And then they apologize and they get away with it. And then they have track records that look like this for 10 years. And it's very difficult to keep up with them. We need to get to some justice. While all of this is happening in Utah, they start testing some backlogged kits. They start testing and Nicholas's DNA comes up as a perfect match for an unsolved sexual assault. So they put out a warrant for his arrest. At this point, they were also looking for him because his foster mother claimed that he had opened up over 20 credit cards in her husband's name and stole about $200,000 from her and him. So he's got financial fraud. He's got abuse. He's got, I, I, this guy's got it all. And they're finally looking for him. So they put out this warrant for arrest in September of 2020. While this is happening, he moves on to his third wife, Miranda. That's the woman that you saw in the beginning of the video. The one that was supposed to catch his fall. Now, all of this, all of this has happened. And Miranda is either a ride or die that doesn't care that he's a piece of crab. Or I'm going to be honest. Nah, I was about to say Miranda's a dumb. But I don't know. I mean, like, maybe she just believes him. I don't know what Miranda's doing, but she's still with him. And so Nicholas gets this brilliant idea that he wants to fake his own death. Now, he does this by first writing his own 
kind of obituary and celebration of life. And he goes out to local news networks and he tries to send them the obituary as a press release to get these news articles to write about it. That's what he's trying to do. And he's sending them out and sending them out and sending them out. And nobody wants to write about this guy. They're like, who is Nicholas Alverdian? Like, you know, whatever. And they're ignoring it. And this starts to really piss him off. He does manage to write and publish his own obituary, which I'm literally about to show you right now. <laughs> Oh my God, this is, there's one part in this that just really cracks me up. Nicholas Aliverdian's battle for life ended on February 29th, 2020. The children and families in care of the Rhode Island Department of Children, Youth, and Families for whom he inspired and led through turbulent government transgressions have lost a warrior that fought on the front lines for two decades. This guy's a rapist, okay? <laughs> Mr. Aliverdian died two months after going public with his diagnosis of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. He was in his 32nd year. At the bedside were Mrs. Aliverdian, their two children, and extended family. His last words were, Fear not and run towards the bliss of the sun. At the time of his passing, the room was filled with the sounds of the end credits for the 1997 film Contact by composer Alan Silvertree a film and score which held special meaning for Mr. Oliverdian. I had to go find the song. The song that he claims was playing as he died. And I'm gonna play it for you. While reading the quote that he claims he said as he died. Fear not. When I am gone. Run towards. Bliss of the sun. <laughs> Mr. Oliverdian was a devout Roman Catholic. In keeping with Mr. Mr. Oliverdian's wishes, his earthly remains were cremated with his ashes scattered at sea. <laughs> Whenever I think about scattering ashes at sea, I just think about that scene in White Lotus when Tanya tries to throw her mother's ashes out and they blow back in the wind. Statesmen and stateswomen in the House of Representatives and Senate joined with mayors across Rhode Island in homage to a man that they acknowledge as one of the most vocal, outspoken. I'm gonna put the link to this obituary in my YouTube description, and I want you to go read it and pull out the most ridiculous lines from his obituary. And if you don't feel like pulling them out, just scroll through the comments and like the ones that you think that are insane, okay? There's so much more here. There's so much more. <laughs> Nicholas Aliverdian's real mom, his biological mom. So she's alive. Okay, she's alive. She hears that he died. Keep in mind, Nicholas is like 32 years old or so. So his mom's probably no more than maybe late 40s, 50, 60 or something. She's still kicking. So she reaches out to Nicholas Aliverdian's foster mom, the one that he stole the $200,000 from. So both the moms, they're like talking, like they're like chit-chatting with each other. Biological mom is like, can you look into this claim that he died? And then Sharon Lane, that's the foster mom. So we'll just call her Sharon. Okay, so we got bio mom and Sharon. Bio mom is like, can you look into these claims that he died? And Sharon's like, oh my God, I'm right on top of it. So she starts digging around and she reads the obituary and she was like, Nicholas wrote this. She's like, I know his writing. I know the way that he thinks of himself. I know how he writes. He wrote this. And so they're like, okay, so he's not dead and he's faking his death. And she's like, yep. And so then they start telling everybody. <laughs> Did you guys think that this story would be that much of a roller coaster? Like, this guy's a nut. This says, February 1st, 2021. The Providence Journal published a follow up to their report that they had received a rambling, often incoherent, nine page email from someone stating that they were Oliverdian's widow. The email leveled criticisms against the allegations he was facing. I need you to soak that all in. So then a few months later, a priest, uh, Father Bernard Healy, he started getting emails requesting a funeral mass from Aliverdian's widow, okay? So he's emailing media. He's writing his own biography. He's pretending to be a widow, emailing more people. He's trying to get a priest to organize a funeral mass all to 
who fake his own death to avoid these allegations. I, honestly, they're not even allegations, okay? The, the kit had his DNA on it, okay? Let's just lock him up. It takes a very long time, and we fast forward all the way to December of 2021. So the, the priest was getting these emails back in February. Now we get up to December 2021. Y'all know what was happening in 2021, COVID. <coughs> Nicholas Alaverdian gets COVID. This is his Wikipedia page. These are all of the aliases that he was using over the years. I've been calling him Nicholas Alaverdian, but he's just using all of these different names, like nonstop. But so he's been using fake names for the past 10 years. And when he gets COVID, he has to go in for treatment. But he's probably got to use his real name. I cannot confirm that or anything, but that's just what I think might have happened because that's where he actually got arrested. He gets arrested while being treated for COVID in Scotland, but it was under the... Oh, wait, under the name Arthur Knight. Did he check in with Arthur Knight? Okay, listen, listen, everyone. Shut up. My notes are unclear. Oh, okay. I got it. So what happened was he checks in for COVID treatment in Scotland, okay? But he checks in under the name Arthur Knight. That is who he's actively claiming to be. The video you saw earlier, that's where he's claiming to also be Arthur Knight. He checks in under that name, but because he's a fugitive and he has a warrant for his arrest, somebody actually recognized him by his tattoos. And not only the tattoos that they could visibly see, but he had a scar around one area where he had tried to force remove the tattoo himself and that's basically what ousted him so he was arrested and once he was arrested he starts to ramp up this whole victim thing he says I am not Nicholas Alaverdian from Rhode Island I am Arthur Knight I am from Scotland he's got this fake accent and everything okay hold on now that we're all on the same page can you guys watch the video again just to really take in how ridiculous it is? Our lives have been interrupted and we'd like privacy and I would like to go back to being a normal husband. But I, I can't because I can't breathe. I can't walk. Uh, people say that's an act. Let me try to stand up. Let me try to stand up. Exactly. Exactly. What do you say to, to someone who believes that, that you are Nicholas Alaverdian? I am not, oh, not wait. I am not Nicholas Alaverdian. I do not know how to make this clear. What do you say to people who say these are crocodile tears? <laughs> Dude, He's put the in weirdest thing about this is if I walked up to you and I was like, oh my God, you're Candace Johnson. Would you start crying and like saying that you're not like Candace John? Like, would you start crying or would you just be like, what the? F like this overly emotional reaction is so ridiculous and it doesn't match. It just, it doesn't match. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't. Being on a show, this is all an act. <laughs> Oh, Andrea, no, that's, that's a low blow. That's a right low blow. So Nicholas claimed that he is Arthur Knight and he's unable to breathe without oxygen and he also needs a wheelchair. Uh, the court records for the medical reports say that there are no issues with his lungs at all and they're looking to extradite him. I mean, this is actually still going on right now. <laughs> And also, his fingerprints proved that he is actually Nicholas Alaverdian. 